This place is part of your heritage. This place is part of your dream. The people of the Bible are in charge of the land of the Bible. I feel very strongly that there have been so many times in history when Christians have looked the other way, when Jewish people were being attacked. We will ultimately see the world change. God's purposes for Israel just march on, don't they? Shalom. Hello again. Well, this is the last in our uh, Voices from Israel series. We've heard from pilgrims and ordinary people and uh, believers and average folks on the street and so on, the mayor of Jerusalem. Uh, and on this program, we're going to talk to some people who have made Israel their home. Uh, obviously, Americans, British, uh, well, people from every country in the world come to Israel. Some Christian people come and they minister there. Well, they consider that their home. And you know what? That is their home. Uh, that is when the kingdom comes, and it could happen seven years from today, no reason why not. Uh, believers will begin a thousand years of living in Israel and then go on to eternity in the new Jerusalem, a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. So in a way, uh, that is their home. They live there now. We talked first with the McCoys, an American couple. We've developed some wonderful relationships and over a cup of coffee, you know, the, the questions are just naturally generated and people wonder why we're here and it gives us the opportunity to share what the Lord's done in our life and why there's such a love in our heart for Israel and the Jewish people. And it's, it's based upon the truth of God's word that we have embraced in our own life and, and now we act it out by being here. By, you know, it's like God first loved us which makes us capable of loving in return. And, and this is our expression of love to Israel, being here, supporting them in their time of need. We first came in 86, and you see a big difference from now. And, and what's happening is within the Orthodox communities and uh, even with the tension between Palestinian and the Jewish, there's a, a, a new tension in the land but from the Orthodox, they're getting stronger anti-Messianic Jews and believers, but it's because they're feeling, I think, threatened, because the believers are getting stronger. The believers that are here have endured a lot, and they are strong. I believe it's growing. I believe the body here is being added to on a daily basis. And um, I think the Lord is going to continue to bring more from outside coming in, but it's also springing up from within the land. There's um, streams within the Orthodox community that are very wide open. There's also a controversy coming about, about to how, how much to accept the Christians and the funds that are coming in. But all of that is, is really healthy because uh, 20 years ago, they just thought we were idol worshipers and uh, didn't want us to even be here. Uh, the Orthodox are, are by faith waiting for Messiah. We believers believe that by faith Jesus is the Messiah. So we're both in faith waiting for a Messiah and so someday we'll both be worshiping the same Messiah. Well, there will be no doubt uh, when the Lord returns uh, what country is important because he's returning to the Mount of Olives on the east side of Jerusalem. Christians get divided about Israel. They vary from Christian Zionists who pray for the place and favor it and, and support the chosen people in every way to liberal churches that divest themselves from it and uh, <laughs> support the other side. Uh, hard to understand. In any case, uh, we discussed how Christians should feel about Israel uh, with the McCoys. You know, the Bible says that the Lord put blinders on the eyes of the Jews. I think there's been blinders on the eyes of the Christians also. And we have read the Bible front to back and, you know, we've memorized many verses, but We've taken particular words like the word Israel, and we've just thought, it's the church. And it's not, it's Israel. <laughs> you know, God speaks pretty plainly, but we've spiritualized a lot of things over the centuries. And um, it's just like, it's hard to change a mindset. But with the Holy Spirit, and if you open up God's word, and you say, Holy Spirit, teach me the truth of this, rather than just going with, with the pre-conditioned uh, thought about it, the words will come to life in a different fashion. And I believe that the pastors have that responsibility to lead their sheep into the truth. It's their responsibility to understand what God's Word is saying regarding Israel in these days. And now as the Jews started coming back to the land, 
that many, many believers are starting to see that the promises when they say that the Lord has chosen uh, the Jews and, and many of the promises forever, the Lord doesn't change forever. Uh, and so that we feel that actually uh, we as a church are grafted into the promises. So yes, the promises are for us, but, but they're also for the Jews. What's amazing here in Jerusalem is you'll, you'll be with a group of 10 people. There'll be one from South Africa, one from Canada, one from Pennsylvania, one from California. And it's like the Lord is sprinkling all over the world and drawing them out. And as we are faithful to those that are being called, say, and we, we, Derek Prince has this word, that you don't come to Jerusalem, Jerusalem calls you. And as we are willing to, to come, then that one becomes two, becomes 10, becomes 100, and God's purposes are unfolding. So it's an exciting day from that standpoint. I have personally believe that it's the Christian's responsibility to support the saints in, in Israel and to make your donations, not your tithes, but your offerings would go into these ministries that are working here in the land um, to, for the furtherance of the gospel. Um, it's also good just on a humanitarian level to help the Jewish people too, but um, the church needs to rise up and, and take their position in the plans today. The McCoys feel there's a very real spiritual war going on in Israel and the believers are a big part of it. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, uh, kingdom will rise against kingdoms and I believe it's the kingdom of God against the kingdom of Allah. And I believe the Bible's pretty clear about which one will win. And there's so many intercessors around the world praying for the downfall of Islam. It's, I believe it's a matter of time, but yeah, I think it's, you see it here. There's no question about it. It's, it says in the scriptures that all nations will come against Israel, but there, there is a remnant of another nation, of the believers throughout the world that are standing with Israel. And so that there'll be Israel, the remnant of the believers standing with Israel, and all of the political nations that come against Israel. And then the Lord will fight for and, and make his, his name known because he'll fight to preserve his name and the world will know. And uh, that's when Islam will be toppled and, and uh, we'll be into a better time in history of man. I guess the Temple Mount is the center of the conflict between uh, the chosen people, the, the Israelis, and the uh, uh, Arabs who call themselves the Palestinians. David Dolan, our friend, a journalist, uh, has an apartment in Jerusalem with a window that just overlooks the Temple Mount. What a place to live. Uh, we checked with him about the views uh, of the Israelis. I mean, they're under terrific pressure these days. He knows them well. He moves among them. He lives there on the ground every day. He had some very enlightening things to tell us. Well, people are very, very uh, worried about the future. And I've lived in Israel for over 22 years and um, experienced several wars, but not since the very beginning of the state have people, at least this is what they're telling me, have they had such a, a feeling of not only restlessness, but fear. Fear that indeed the Arab world has returned to the path of uh, violence and is determined to destroy Israel. Now, not every Arab country by any means, but a good portion of them. And people are, are quite fearful. Israel has had a nuclear checkmate since uh, the late 1960s. Of course, this is all unofficial. To this day, the Israeli governments have never confirmed that Israel has a nuclear arsenal, but everybody here knows it and everybody outside, all of Israel's enemies have known it. And now their enemies are starting to acquire these same weapons of mass destruction. Of course, chemicals and biological weapons can also kill uh, mass amounts of people, but nuclear weapons are the things that people really fear Pakistan, a Muslim country, not an Arab one, but a Muslim one in the region, already has them. And there is great concern that Iran will soon have them, Syria and others, and that Israel's nuclear checkmate will be eliminated and that this tiny country could well uh, be blasted into oblivion. Now, people aren't openly talking about that, but they're feeling it in their spirits. It's very much in their, um, in their minds in the background. So there's a, a fear level here that I haven't seen 
uh, since I moved here 22 years ago and that uh, veterans are telling me hasn't existed since the founding of the state. Since uh, our interview was recorded, Israel has finished a large portion of its uh, fence, which is designed to keep out the terrorists, and it is certainly working very well. We asked David about the uh, diminishing violence in the Holy Land. Well, the whole context of this current violence is, of course, a peace process, a failed peace process, but nonetheless one in which Israel was giving away strategic land even right around this city, just a couple miles from here, territory was handed over to Yasser Arafat, all of the south of the city, Bethlehem, and that area was handed over to him. This was very risky, giving arms to the Palestinian police uh, that they might control terrorism internally. Uh, that was risky because those arms could be turned against Israel. How do you respond to this? How do you fight against this? It's a very difficult thing, and for a democracy, it's particularly difficult, as the United States has found out, because you don't want to harm civilians, even though the other side is deliberately attacking civilians. You don't want to harm civilians in response, but uh, some are going to get killed in the process of responding. Israel's policy of trying to find the leaders of the Hamas movement, Islamic Jihad, these other radical groups that are openly taking responsibility for these severe terror attacks uh, means that um, some civilians are going to be killed as well. Uh, again, this is regrettable. The Israeli army and leaders always regret this, but I haven't seen any evidence that the Israelis have deliberately targeted civilians or just said, well, we don't care that there are civilians there, we're going to go after this person anyway. They've calculated each time, is it safe, will civilians be killed? They've miscalculated a number of times as well, but again, it's not a deliberate thing, and so I think that despite the controversy, the moral high ground in this issue still belongs to Israel. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. Arise, walk through the land, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Join Zola Levitt on his next tour of Israel and worship in the shadows of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Behold the land of the covenant. For a biblical perspective on what is happening in Israel and the Middle East, ask for Zola's free monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. Call toll-free 1-800-WONDERS. Zola's new catalog describes his books, teaching tapes, and correspondence course. For Zola's free newsletter and catalog, please call 1-800-WONDERS. Well, it uh, certainly should surprise no Bible reader that uh, there is a war going on between militant Islam and uh, practically all the rest of us, especially uh, we Christians. 
Uh, our friend Avi Lipkin is a commentator. He was a spokesman for the uh, Israeli Defense Forces when we first had him on the program. We have him on from time to time, very, very knowledgeable in this area. And we talked to him about uh, the tensions going on right now with Islam and Christianity. Well, you know, Zola, I've been doing shows with you for over 10 years now. And uh, I, I was mostly working in the United States of America. And then little by little, I went into Canada. But now Switzerland, Norway, Finland, Holland, Belgium, Greece, Russia, all these countries are now inviting me to come and speak. There are many other countries that have also invited me and I haven't gone yet. Uh, my work is now uh, branching out greatly into Europe because Europe is most greatly threatened today by the Islamic demographic invasion, by the Islamic investments in their economy, and of course we can't forget the oil and the gas. Uh, because of the proximity, uh, they are very, very much more dependent on the oil and gas from the Middle East than America is. Uh, the Europeans are very, very uh, trembling. They're very worried from the threat of Islam. America has much less of a problem as far as statistically uh, the, the Islamic population in America is much less. Austria, for example, uh, according to the information I have, is 20% Muslim. In other words, in 30 years from now, they will be the majority. Uh, the French have 17% Muslims. Uh, in 40 years, France will be a Muslim country. England, I think, is about 10%. Uh, United States is somewhere between 6 and 7% Muslim today, I believe, but they do outnumber the Jews. So Islam is today uh, conquering the Christian countries of the world. Avi is a man who is sought after as a speaker, and he addresses audiences in many countries. We asked him what he's been saying and what is the source of his information. Very simply, I quote very directly from what the Quran says, and I also debunk what it says in English, because what it says in Arabic is something else. For example, when it says fighting is obligatory upon you in chapter 2, verse 216, in Arabic it doesn't say fighting, it says slaughtering with the sword, uktul in Arabic. So I'm very, very careful about what I say. And then I, I give my interpretation based also on what Rachel, my wife, taught me because my wife was born in Egypt. She left Egypt at age 20. Arabic is her mother tongue. And the Muslims said to her these things, that they were going to kill the Jews on Saturday and they were going to kill the Christians on Sunday because the Jews are the Saturday people and the Christians are the Sunday people. Rachel had given me a quote uh, from a sermon at the, on the Temple Mount in which uh, the Mufti of Jerusalem, his name is Sheikh Sabri, said, kill the Jews, kill the Christians. Kill the Israelis, kill the Americans. Kill the children of the apes and kill the children of the swine. And uh, so the Saudis attacked me for that quote, but what the Saudis did for me was they gave me the date on which the Mufti made the speech. I didn't know the date. Rachel just quoted it and reported it to her bosses. Um, and so the Saudis never denied that the things that I was saying uh, were true. These are things that uh, my wife has been saying to me for 35 years. Uh, I think my two years in the Prime Minister's office as senior editor and translator and my 14 years as an Israeli army spokesman, privy to the information we were getting from the uh, Israeli army general staff. These things uh, helped me to come out with exactly what's true and I think 9-11 was kind of a confirmation of all the things that I've been saying in my lectures, in my books, in my tapes, all these things are absolutely true. Uh, for example, in my first book is Fanatic Islam, a Global Threat, which you offer as part of your ministry. On page 96, there is an article there that I quote, the, of a small article from the Idiot Achronot Israeli newspaper, the biggest paper in Israel, uh, an article about the first class of kamikaze pilots graduating from Iran. This was in 1995. And if you remember, the 19 who killed themselves on 9-11 came to the States about five or six years before, legally, with visas. So uh, these were the kamikaze pilots, I believe, who were trained in Iran. So yes, indeed, this was in my book. Uh, my first book is Fanatic Islam, a Global Threat. Avi speaks right to the point about Islam, and that, uh, in some cases, takes some guts. Uh, we asked him about uh, <laughs> the dangers of what he does and how he ministers. I live to fight God's war. And when I was in Switzerland, and 20 or 30 Muslims would come into the meeting out of 300 people, and they'd sit in the front row and look at me straight in the eye, and I'd look at them straight in the eye. And Rachel was trembling, and the Christians were afraid because nobody expected so, so much uh, antagonism and so much opposition from the Muslims who came to the meetings. And um, I, I, at the end of the meetings, believe it or not, I was hugging with these people. They came up to me, why do you say this and why do you say that? And my wife and I were answering them in Arabic. And I said to them, I don't hate you Muslims, I love you guys. 
I just feel bad for you because you are in chains. You are in bondage from Islam. And you need to renounce Islam and come over to, to Judeo-Christianity. I mean, you want to be a Jew, you want to be a Christian, but renounce Allah because Allah is Satan. And they say, no, that's not true, and you, you're wrong, and come to our mosque and we'll explain it to you. So I'll meet them in a church or in a public place, not in a mosque. We asked Avi about the military capabilities of Israel's uh, hostile neighbors, and uh, in view of that, what he sees coming up in the future. Iran is very close to nuclear missile capability. They have the Shihab-3. That is the, the vehicle that will bring the nuclear warhead. The nuclear warheads they will have probably, according to Israeli army assessments, they will have the nuclear warheads within a year or so. Um, God may intervene in many, many ways. We don't know exactly, but I don't think that Israel will be able to wait a year. Uh, I also, another thing, and I, I explained this in my third book, uh, this, the Almanac's book, that the Saudis have a missile base with 120 Chinese missiles, and they have Pakistani nuclear warheads. So the Saudis already have nuclear warheads. Uh, the Syrians have 300 scuds with biological and chemical weapons, as well as conventional. Uh, they have 700 frogs. They could plaster all of Israel, the Syrians. Egyptians, nobody talks about the Egyptians. They have missiles too. Um, the Hezbollah in the north of Israel could open up uh, simultaneously with everybody else with a massive Katyusha and missile attack on the north of Israel. Uh, and I have a feeling it's going to come down very, very soon. I think the reason for that is they're going to sneak attack Israel in order to bring in the whole Arab world uh, against Israel and the United States in Iraq. This is my personal opinion. I've been wrong before, but, and I pray to God I'll be wrong this time too because I don't want to see any war. The potential for war is uh, pretty much, as Avi says, uh, in my opinion, uh, we, we, <laughs> we're not really conducting a war on terrorism and we're letting it get out of hand. We need to get immediate control of Saudi Arabia, Iran, Syria, at the very least. Uh, the PLO, Israel's taking care of, and Libya seems pacified. Egypt is uh, very weak. And, uh, but these militant areas, uh, the, the Saudis with the Wahhabism there are preaching everywhere, the Iranians with a th nuclear threat, for heaven's sake, and Syria with its uh, hospitality to all terrorist groups, its drug running, its, its utter hostility, its primitive ways. I, I don't know what to say. We have to get this job done. We, we can't spend a century in Iraq. We've got to get the rest of them and take them down some way. Otherwise, we're going to have real trouble. Avi also addresses a lot of Jewish audiences, and I asked him what he says to the uh, Jewish people in the synagogues about Christians. There are two things that have happened in the last 500 years, and it seems like Jewish people uh, are not really very um, uh, um, capable of changing their views in spite of 500 years. Uh, the firstly is the 500 years of the Protestant Reformation. Now, the Crusaders were not Protestants. There was no Protestant Reformation at that time. Uh, at that time, they were Catholic. Uh, the Jews know 2,000 years of Catholic persecution. It is only with this last pope that there have been really, really radical changes in the Catholic ideology regarding the Jews. Uh, the Jews are right in feeling bad about what the Catholics did to the Jews in 2,000 years. The Jews are right in feeling bad about what the Russian Orthodox Church did to the Jews uh, in the 1,000 years that the Russian Orthodox Church was there. Uh, but the Jews are, are really, really wrong, and it's a sin to the Jews, not only to the Christians, that the Jews do not wake up and learn about the Protestant Reformation. Because the Protestant Reformation was a blessing to the Jews. The Protestants did not, as a rule, uh, persecute the Jews. Uh, when Jews fled from Spain, many of them went to Morocco and Turkey, which were Islamic countries, but many went to Holland, Belgium, and England under Oliver Cromwell. Uh, American Jews have never been killed for being Jews. No Jew was ever killed in America or Canada or Australia. Oliver Cromwell, like I said, blessed the Jews in England. Uh, the, the Jews were blessed in the Dutch colonies. Uh, the Jews need to do a lot of homework and study about the Protestant Reformation. By the way, the Catholic Church burned Jews at the stake in the Inquisition, and they burned Protestants at the stake in the Inquisition, too. Uh, so you have what I call a positive mutation in Christianity. The Protestant uh, Reformation was a positive mutation in Christianity. Now, what has happened in the last 50 or 100 years is that there was a super negative mutation in Islam with the, with the return of the Jews to the land of Israel. 
So now all of a sudden, whereas uh, Islam controlled the Holy Land for 1,300 years, now for the last 50, 60 years, the land has returned to the infidel. The Jew and the Christian are infidels. And so uh, the Islamic world today cannot prove that Allah u Akbar, that Allah is greater than God. See, they say their God Ishma of Ishmael, the moon God, the war God, the sword God of Allah, is greater than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you know that Satan, Lucifer, said he was greater than God. So the Muslims basically are saying their God is greater than our God. Their God of the sword is greater than our God of the peace. So Islam cannot prove that their God is greater until Israel is destroyed. And it's one of the reasons why I am working uh, very diligently for a Judeo-Christian alliance globally, and I'm also working for a Judeo-Christian alliance in Jerusalem. Well, it's an interesting concept, a Judeo-Christian alliance. There should be such a thing. Is it going on in your town? Because I'm going to tell you something. If, if the Jews and Christians will not unite against Islam, uh, they're going to make things very, very hot for us. I said before, take down Iran, Saudi Arabia, Syria. By that, I don't mean necessarily to do it militarily, but at least let's stop all the talk and let's stop the dithering and talk real serious to them. Uh, gunboat diplomacy isn't really necessary. I think we can uh, convince these people to change their ways. But it, it's not going to be done with the UN, etc. We've got to get up and do it. Uh, you know, Israel's God's timepiece. It got the terrorism first. Now it's criticized for defending itself. Look at prophecy. Are you with the promised land? Don't be with the people that divested from it, whatever you do. And Shalom Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our offer on this program is the video series, Voices from Israel. This 10-program series traverses the Holy Land with Zola and a group of pilgrims, from the Galilee in the north to the City of Gold, Jerusalem. This series also scans Israel's wide political landscape with the perspectives of government officials and those who have chosen to support the land of Israel. Three videos, 10 programs, Voices from Israel. And you may also call toll-free for our colorful monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. This free publication includes Bible lessons, insightful news commentary, Hebrew lessons, and personal notes from Zola. Call 1-800-WONDERS. That's 1-800-966-3377. Or write to Zola, Box 12268, Dallas, Texas 75225. You can also see our Levitt Letters, TV programs, and national airing schedule at www.levitt.com. Please remember, Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. Shalom, Shalom, Shalom.